How many of you have read Centennial by James Michener? One? Come on. No readers here? The last page. Do you remember the last page? The last page of Michener's book Centennial says, In the future, cows will all be kept in a pen and fed. The cowboys will wear white coats and carry a clipboard. Where's your white coat? <laughs> Too hot. <laughs> the dry lot project started here in 1972. And it started when the cows were brought in to eat the irrigated forage that this station was built to study irrigation production. Some of you have heard this before, but when I came in 1979, we had straight bred Hereford cows that were fed corn silage and alfalfa hay in the bunk every day of the year. I put a whole ear of corn in there the next day it was still in the bunk. <clears throat> the cows didn't know that they could eat that. And we started feeding straw and they didn't think they had to eat that. And now Chanda talks about us feeding corn stover and there's a little resistance there. But these cows are survivors and they're going to eat essentially what we give them. So the whole idea of dry lot cows has kind of blossomed in the last uh, year, especially or two years. But it's, it's been kind of off and on over the years. In 1983, I went to eastern Montana with a severe drought and talked about how they can keep their herds together in a dry lot by feeding wheat meds and straw, essentially. And, and some of the guys did it, and it worked, and they were happy with it. So in a crisis, putting cows in a pen for a short period of time or a longer period of time works OK. Um, the study that. I want to talk about here a little bit now is a six-year study. We've got three years of data accumulated. The information in the handout that you have is, is from uh, the cow side up through weaning. Uh, we do have another paper coming that, that will address the finishing and the replacement heifer selection from dry lot versus pasture. So there is uh, su substantial in interest in dry lot cows all the way down through the Corn Belt. And as you drive around North Dakota and other states, you see that there's a lot of hay land and a lot of pasture land that has been tilled or sprayed, and there are soybeans growing there now, and, and uh, we're losing our, our livestock base. And so we look at corn stover and distillers grains, or pea straw in this case, or wheat straw, CRP hay, whatever we can to match the cow's nutrient needs, and all the co-products we have, distillers, grains, and wheat meds, and barley malt, and canola meal and condensed separator byproduct and beet pulp and maybe sugar beets and some other things. These cows will just eat about anything including onions and chocolate and pumpkins. If you can uh, mash it up and feed it, uh, and it's got some nutritional value. Uh, if your cows are getting to be kind of the, the style that these cows are, they'll eat whatever we put in the bunk. Uh, that'll work rather well. And so in the first three years we have made the conclusion that it's biologically possible to be fairly close in dry lot production to the pasture production. Uh, this is fairly pure in terms of the dry lot production system where the calves are fed a creep feed diet in the bunk over here that has uh, substantial amounts of forage in it because when they're out on grass they're going to they're gonna get some grass. So it's not a high priced creep feed. And our observation is that the dry lot calves are going to eat uh, considerably um, so we uh, eat a little bit less creep feed than the pasture calves because we wean them in September. We wean the pasture calves in, in late October, so they're eating creep feed a little bit longer. These cows are Red Angus, Red Simmental, Cross, uh, spring calving, average calving days about April 1st. We do have a really good drop in the first uh, conception period, so there's about 85% drop in the first cycle. Uh, but you see on our on the sheet that we had uh, um, relatively modest conception rate of 86 percent or so and, and we could do a little better than that but we do uh, a fairly rigid 45-day breeding season on these girls. Biologically it's possible if you do your nutritional uh, program properly and you put what in the book what the cow needs uh, she will do very well. Uh, economically we're challenged because it costs money for feed, it costs money to feed these girls and so we have uh, an issue of how do we do this and if you can integrate this dry lot cow operation with the sizable crop farm where you have some residues, you have some byproducts, you have some grain screenings or some other feed products that have minimal value, that might be uh, the linchpin to make a dry lot cow operation possible. If we could turn these calves out on a little patch of green grass, an uh, acre or two, and let them graze, that will reduce the creep feed intake substantially and increase their weaning weight by 10 to 15 percent. 
So we have some things we can do that we've studied before we started this formal trial to improve the dry lot scenario, but we wanted to address this from a more of a, of a pure perspective, this, this particular uh, study. The pasture cows are 15 miles away and uh, grazing season long uh, native pastures. It is uh, <coughs> bottom and some flats that are essentially not tillable. So it is uh, uh, native grassland and they graze from late May. This year it was early June because our turnout was late to about the 1st of December when the cows come back and go into their wintering pens. So you look at the numbers on the sheet there and, and you know we're a little behind on the dry lot side for uh, pounds. We're a little higher on the cost of feed. So we got some things that we, we really could do to, make, to improve that. But you know, dry lot isn't all that bad. You're paying your farming enterprise for the feeds and the forages that, that you're gathering up and the corn stover certainly is one of those. The corn stover issue in this part of the country uh, probably has some challenges because crop guys want to leave as much residue on the field as they can. Uh, farther south in Iowa where there's corn on corn or corn corn beans, the residue becomes a little bit more of a problem and they don't mind having some of the residue come off the field. Well the best way to use the residue is to graze that in the fall, but then you've got the summer window of time where you don't have pasture and you want to do the cows and so We think it's essential that you harvest some of that residue, some of that stover, and one of the approaches that we're working on in the future is to look at harvesting the good parts of the corn stover. Uh, if you look at the analysis of the leaf and the husk, it's like it's like pretty good hay. And then you look at the cob and the stock, you know, and that's kind of like the plywood fraction. You really don't want to have that uh, gathered up if you can help it. And so if we can gather the husk and the leaf, that amounts to about 30-35% of the plant material. That's about what the crop guys are willing to let go. We've got the best part of that plant. And how do we get that off the field? Do we follow the combine? with a baler and just pick up that combine stream. Um, neighbor up north has an all crop header. So he cuts the corn plant down about a foot high and, and it all goes through the combine and, and he bales all that material and it's half ground and shredded. Problem is we don't have any all crop headers left in the corn industry to speak of. You have to drive your combine too slow so nobody wants to, to run an all crop header. The idea of using corn stover as a base forage I think is valuable. Uh, the work being done in Kansas and Nebraska with adding hydrated lime and grinding it twice and adding moisture to 50% um, looks really, really good, but it's a lot of fussing around. It takes some time and money to, to do all this. Uh, you got to pack the stuff. It, it creates heat, uh, breaks down the lignin, but it's a much better feed. Is there a commercial system that could be developed that you could drive into a yard and uh, put the corn stover in the tub and grind it all up and add the moisture and add the hydrated lime and come out with a product that would go into a bag and and the uh, processor would drive away and you'd end up with a good supply of high quality feed for your cows. Uh, not yet, but some enterprising entrepreneur <coughs> could, could come up with that. I guess the bottom line of our dry lot uh, research is that if we look at uh, equivalent cost of producing calves here in the, in the pen, and what that means in terms of pasture rent, uh, we're, we're paying $43 an acre equivalent for pasture rent. Uh, I don't know how many people are paying $43 an acre. Uh, I do hear stories that, that there are uh, rents in that $35 to $40 range, so we're, we're awful darn close. And if we can improve on our dry lot performance a little bit, cheap enough for rations here, we're gonna be very competitive economically. <coughs> and part of the chemistry of all that is the manure from a dry lot cow for the summer period in our study from uh, late May to late September is worth about $60 a head. That's extra fertilizer that you're getting out of the cow from the feed and you, you compost that, you stack it, you put it back on the field, that's equivalent fertility value. So I think that has some merit in, in uh, giving us a, some positive feeling about uh, putting cows in a pen. And, and keeping track of where that manure and those nutrients go. So I believe that we have some um, work to be done here yet, but I think we've got some, some things we can talk about that, that look fairly promising. So any uh, questions about the dry lot? You were talking about uh, before you started with putting lime on corn stover. Um, I have a good friend in Iowa that they didn't get a very good corn crop. 
So they were talking about instead of doing silage, they did corn stover and added some sort of supplement to it to make it like silage. Is that a, something that's possible around here or cost effective or how's that? Mm -hmm. um, I know you have to add 5% calcium hydroxide plus 50% water. And I don't know what the calcium product costs, but if that might be what your, your colleague did to increase the value of the feed cost, I can't tell you. Anybody have any ideas? That guy said it replaces, down in South Dakota at that conference, replaces 15% on fattening cattle by doing that. Replaces 15% of the ration? 15% of, uh, of the uh, energy force of the ration. Well, I know the reports that you read and the guys I've talked to from down south claim that it really improves the feed quality of corn stover. So, uh, but it's a, it's a bit of a process to, to get done. So. But stay tuned, read what you can about that. I'm sure there'll be more that comes out. With, with your conception rate in 45 days, that's very acceptable, uh, I would say. Uh, is there a way to, what would you expect if you bumped your energy a little bit, 30 days pre-breeding, 30 days post, how much could you change it? Would it be cost effective to do that? But that's very good in 45 days. I'm not being critical of the conception rate, but could you change it 5% and by adding a little extra energy and would it help your bottom line the next year. Question is, could we increase energy pre-breeding pre and during breeding and increase the conception rate five or more percent? In 45 days. In a, in a 45 day season. Uh, good, good thought. Um, our cows seem to be cycling reasonably well and like I say, we have that drop. 85% of our cows drop in the first cycle, so we're, we're getting some attention there. You know, in a dry lot setting, what you put in the bunk is what those cows get. Nothing more, nothing less. And so if we are missing the boat there a little bit, uh, we maybe could try some of that. I'm not suggesting that you are. I'm wondering if your the opens that you're having are reabsorptions and that sort of thing. I'm not I'm just wondering if eighty five percent is as good as it gets, so we can expect that, or if there's a way to tweak it a little bit. And we uh, handle our cows more than a producer does too, and that's the other, you know, concern. A little extra stress for the I, I'm not being there. critical of eighty five percent because if they had three more weeks they'd be 92 be to 94 yeah. Yeah. so i'm not critical of the percentage i'm just wondering if there's a way that that you could change it a little bit and be i'm just wondering we never you're... seem to be short of protein energy we uh we tend to push some of these low quality forages maybe a little so, more than... so do we that's why i'm asking yeah. <laughs>